person or online. We are very grateful for the opportunity of gathering and celebrating impressive developments in ecclesiology that have been promoted by the scholarship of our distinguished colleague, uh, Professor Richard Gagliardi. In our department, Professor Gagliardi is the Joseph Professor of Catholic Systematic Theology, and as we know, he just finished his term as the chair of our department in the last six years. He previously taught at the University of Toledo as the Thomas and Margaret Murray and James J. Basic Professor of Catholic Studies and the University of St. Thomas Graduate School of Theology in Houston. He received a BA in Humanities from the University of Texas and an MA in Biblical Theology from St. Mary's University in San Antonio and both an MA and a PhD in Systematic Theology from the University of Notre Dame. His list of publications is both remarkable and impressive. Professor Gagliardi was president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, the largest professional association of Catholic theologians in the world, and he received numerous prestigious awards in recognition of his contributions to the life of the Church. With his publishing, lecturing, mentoring, and teaching, Professor Gagliardi has enriched the interpretation and reception of the Second Vatican Council the reflection on the role and responsibilities of the magisterium, as well as the challenges of priestly formation in today's world. Today, senior colleagues and emerging scholars in the field of ecclesiology will guide us in examining and appreciating Professor Bayard's contributions and their relevance in addressing ongoing issues in ecclesiology. Professor Dennis Doyle, Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton will open our conference. The panel will continue to stimulate our reflection with the contributions of Professor Elise Abbey, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Santa Clara University, Professor Edward Annenberg, Brink Chair in Catholic Theology and Chair of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at John Carroll University, and Professor J.C. Joseph, Assistant Professor of Ecclesiology and Theology at Minister at Villanova University. Professor Susan Wood, Professor of Systematic Theology at Regis College in Toronto, will further enrich our day by focusing on the missionary global church in the theology of Professor Bayardi. Plenty of time for discussion will foster our engagement and participation. Now, without further ado, I invite Professor Jerry Wiggins to launch our work together, our first conference. I just would like to add a few words of my own. I didn't, in fact, conspire with Craig in thinking about um, the themes that were really on my heart as we come into this event. Uh, but I have been very, very grateful to be part of the process of planning this event to honor a good and wonderful colleague and a good and wonderful friend and a good mentor teacher. We know that God works all things together for good, and it's doubtless good that we are here together. We know that we are the beneficiaries of countless blessings, and not least among them the blessing to be here together in one another's company, to profit from institutions others have built to examine questions so worthy of our attention, to reach together for wisdom for understanding. We are indeed privileged, and it behooves us in gratitude to remember what our privilege requires of us. As I mentioned last night, there are passages of life that reveal the quality not only of our faith, but especially of our hope. Hope, Christian hope, regards a good that is impossible to us by ourselves, but possible through the help of another. It is only hope that can announce with the Apostle that all the travails of this life count as nothing next to the glory to be revealed in us. It is hope that lets go of all that we cannot control and the confidence that all things work together for the good of those who love God. When a man 
sorely tested, is not preoccupied by what may happen to him, but concerns himself only with what it is incumbent upon him to do, with how best he can care for the ones he loves and the things entrusted to him. It is impossible, I find, not to admire him, for he is a model of hope. He shows himself ready to bow his head to a wisdom higher than his own, a wisdom that orders all things to the good, though we know not how. Of all the things I have learned from Rick, and of all the things I expected to learn from Rick, this lesson of hope is the most precious to me. We are pleased today not only to present an exceptional slate of papers, but also to include some of Rick's former and current students to introduce our speakers and moderate the sessions. Without further ado, therefore, I would like to turn this mic over to Nicole Riley. Nicole holds her doctorate in historical theology from Boston College. She has published on the Victorines and Teresa de Cartagena. She is currently at Loyola University, Maryland, where she is a theology lecturer and director of operations for their theology graduate programs. Nicole. Criticisms raised today. 
Um, over the past few months, I have read or reread all of Rick's authored and edited books, as well as many articles, book reviews, columns, etc. I've also read a good bit of material about Rick's work. He called this task my penance. <laughs> I told him that I was enjoying my penance. Something that has characterized Rick's work is his attempt to address simultaneously his academic peers as well as a broader audience of ministers, catechists, and everyday Christians. He expresses this goal in some form in the introductory material of virtually every one of his books. He even made this point to me about my lecture this morning. He wants me to explain things in a way that the whole audience can understand and not simply presuppose that everyone here is already an expert in ecclesiology and church authority. I used to call Francis Sullivan of Boston College the authority on authority in the Catholic Church. I remember in 2011, I went up to Father Sullivan at the end of an academic session at some conference or another. As I was telling him that he's the best, he said, well, I, I don't know. I think we've found somebody who can replace me. He nodded toward the back of the room with Rick Gillardi. I remember I said, well, he's really good, but he's still a long way from being you. <laughs> it was that year that Rick was hired to take over Sullivan's position at Boston College. <laughs> Later, Sullivan would give high praise to Rick in his review of an article of a 2012 book that Rick edited when the Magisterium intervenes, which addressed the doctrinal investigation of Elizabeth Johnson as a case study. After a long and glowing summary that considered every essay in the volume, Sullivan wrote, In my opinion, Gallardi's insistence that theologians and bishops have teaching authority that is proper to their different roles in the church, and his identification of the features that ought to characterize that, that their exercise of that distinctive teaching authority, are consistent with his reputation as one of the foremost Catholic ecclesiologists of our time. The reasons he has given for judging to what degree these characteristics are present in the exercise of teaching authority by Elizabeth Johnson and by the Committee on Doctrine and its chairperson seem to me to be well founded in the dossier published in the book. And so with such high praise coming from the authority on authority, it was not long before my own classes that I began to tell my students that Rick Gillardi was now the authority on authority in the Catholic Church. So I want to focus this first lecture today on the legacy of Rick Gillardi, upon which we are to consider building. Among the many dimensions of his work, I will concentrate mainly on the topic of church authority. Rick is someone who has laid out a consistent framework and vision of church authority that supports the Snowden way currently being pursued by Pope Francis on a global scale. I will concentrate mainly on three early books, one which he recently revised and expanded, but with some uh, significant mentions of the development of key themes in his later books. Rick's works carry out an agenda that was already laid out in his first book, his 1992 Witnesses to the Faith, which itself was a somewhat condensed version of his dissertation written at Notre Dame under the direction of Thomas O'Meara. You may have also heard of one or two of his readers, Richard McBrien, Richard McCormick, Lawrence Cunningham. In Rick's dissertation acknowledgments, he mentions having had significant conversations with Francis Sullivan, Herman Potmeyer, and Hervé Legrand. As I read this book, which again is basically his dissertation, and I did get my hands on his dissertation, I didn't bring it with me because I didn't want to pay for extra luggage <laughs> on the flight. But, um, in his dissertation, not, oh, as I read the book, uh, with the hindsight of 30 years, I found it jaw-dropping as to how many of the topics that he would address throughout his career are already there in an in-depth way. Rick's focus was the ordinary universal magisterium over a period of 150 years up to the then present. Rick studied not only official Catholic teaching, but also the treatment of the ordinary universal magisterium in a broad number of Jesuit 
theology manuals written in Latin, as well as in the writings of a wide range of theologians in English and German, with a few sources in French and Italian. You've heard the phrase, a universe containing a grain of sand. Rick explores the entire universe of modern and contemporary Catholic authority and ecclesiology using the issue of the ordinary universal magisterium as his grain of sand. He tells the narrative of how this concept, quote, which might appear to further the cause of a Gallican Episcopalism, in reality was employed to strengthen the magisterial authority of the papacy. He traces out the long road to Vatican II with its reaffirmation of the episcopacy and the College of Bishops as possessing, with the Bishop of Rome, supreme authority over the whole church, and its reaffirmation of local church as the place where the universal church is realized through the ministries of word and sacrament. He argues for an alternative theology by which, according, by which echoing the book's title, bishops are witnesses to the faith of the local church. He calls for the strengthening of structures by which bishops can listen to each other. Drawing upon a point taken from a Latin manual written by Francis Sullivan, Galori asserts that only residential bishops, not titular bishops, should participate in the ordinary universal magisterium. Now, a titular bishop is a bishop who has a, a, the title of bishop without having a diocese. It doesn't have anything to do with the table. It's just, it's just titles, titles. But, um, Building upon the work of John Henry Newman, John Marie T.R., and Eve Congar, he outlines a shift in the starting point for understanding authority from the papacy to the communion of churches. Now, Rick documents well the places from which he drew many of his insights, but it's clear that this powerfully assembled package expresses an overall vision that is original to Rick. Many of the individual elements of this vision are now associated with other ecclesiologists, and some might be treated today simply as common knowledge among experts. Bishops don't just receive universal teachings from the Pope in Rome and carry them under their diocese, though that may be part of what they do. At least as basic, however, is the role of bishops as a witness to the faith of the local church, a witness that must be shared with other bishops. And collegiality might refer first of all to bishops, but understood properly as a concept and a practice that includes the lay faithful in an integral manner. The claim in the book title that bishops should be witnesses to the faith of the local churches, as well as the need for bishops and theologians and the lay faithful to listen to each other is at the core of Pope Francis's idea of sin and out. Now in the conclusion to this work, Rick discusses four topics that need further development. The role of bishops in the early church, levels of teaching and the type of ascent called for by each, a more coherent theology of the episcopate, and pneumatology, especially in regard to the assistance of the Holy Spirit in decision making, in a way that stresses the importance of the reception of church teaching. And so, this was a 1991 dissertation, uh, a 1992 book. Now, in most dissertations, the mentioning of topics that call for further development is, for the most part, a conventional way of saying to the readers that this dissertation is done, thank you. <laughs> In this case, though, the topics needing further development named a real agenda that we carry out in depth in Rick's later works. I am impressed by how Rick's graduate training and dissertation work molded him into being a true expert in his field. If his first book were to be volume one of his collected works, it could function practically as an introduction to one coherent, if widely ranging, multi volume work. Rick was trained to be an expert in his well defined field. He has studied in depth the manuals, the theological writings, the church documents, and the history related to 19th and 20th century Catholicism. The connections between his graduate work and his life's work can serve as a model to administrators, educators, and students of the value of establishing a well-focused research agenda early on and then carrying out that agenda over a lifetime. He left Notre Dame as a person fully prepared to pursue a clear academic mission. 
His second book, the 1997 Teaching with Authority, continues his effort to address simultaneously the academy and those being trained for ministry. He uses for the first time a phrase that I've heard him say many times, zero-sum game. The process of decision-making should not be a zero-sum game. Rick will develop this theme of not a zero-sum game in his later work as calling for decision-making processes based on relationships that are non-competitive, especially in his, in his 2015 book, An Unfinished Council. He grounds his vision of a non-competitive theology in the documents and processes of Vatican II. The Pope and the bishops do not need to be in competition for power. The laity do not need to be in a competition with the ordained or in the magisterium with the whole Christian faithful. Bishops and theologians and lay people should be working together in a mutually supportive way, not in a contest, though the rightful place of disagreement and conflict are also to be valued. Including and empowering others enhances rather than diminishes one's own authority and power. But I might mention that for Rick, the ideal of theologians and bishops being non competitive is a matter on which, uh, from earlier years, he had to kind of grow personally. Have you ever seen Rick interact with a church leader who was perhaps not such a good listener? I remember being in a room with him and with a certain church leader who was criticizing a draft of a document that Rick and I and others had worked on. It quickly became clear that this particular person was not widely read when it came to contemporary academic theology. Now, me, I get nervous in these situations. My response was so passive aggressive <laughs> that it, it would take days, if ever, for that person to figure out that I had been contradicting him. <laughs> but in, in contradiction, as soon as this person started talking, Rick got like this little smile on his face. You know, kind of, kind of. Clint Eastwood smile. You know, is it really a smile? It's just like this hardly visible thing at the corner of your mouth, you know? And I, you know, I didn't know what he was thinking, but I, I, I speculated it's probably something like, come on, make my day. <laughs> you know, Rick, Rick waited until several other people had spoken, and by that time the smile was gone, Rick's demeanor was respectful, but he directly schooled that person in an upfront manner. If I remember, it didn't, didn't go well. <laughs> One result was that Rick was banned from speaking in a certain diocese. That, but that was all many years ago. He really does sincerely believe in the ideal of a non-competitive approach. A, a related theme developed in Rick's later works is something he labeled eschatological humility. At first, I thought he was referring mainly to church leaders, but as time went by, I realize that he's talking about all of us, including academic theologians. When it comes to the experience of divine revelation, there is so much that we don't know. And of the things that we do know, there is so much that we do not fully comprehend. We all need to listen humbly to each other. So if empowering and including will enhance one's own power, what is it that will diminish one's power? According to Rick, it is an over-reliance on formal authority to the neglect of reason, of argumentation, and debate. The assistance of the Holy Spirit will more likely be present within a lively interchange among faith-filled people than in solitary pronouncements from one high. In his later work, Rick will come to label this theme ecclesial vitality as distinct from ecclesial structures especially in his 2006 book, The Church in the Making. Ecclesial vitality characterizes a church community that is actually living a spirit-filled life. Ecclesial structures are important, even essential, but they must be implemented in the service of ecclesial vitality. Rick will clarify this thing by bringing out an ecumenical point. In traditional Catholic theology, even before the Council, it was recognized that, in the midst of disagreements about leadership and teachings, it is possible that some other Christian communities might be doing a better job of actually living out the Christian faith. Rick connects ecclesial vitality with the active presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Turning back to the internal issues of authority within the Catholic Church, he argues that the active presence of the Holy Spirit, the spirit that animates the entire church, makes for better decision making. This is another one of the positions of his that undergirds the synodal process of Pope Francis. In this same 1997 book, Rick holds that bishops and the Pope are legitimately the leaders and final decision makers of the church. This is a church, however, in which the word of God is given to all the faithful. The distinction between the ordained priest and the common priesthood of the faithful may be an essential one. But we're all still human beings who share a fundamental equality and spiritual dignity. Rick develops these points further in later articles, arguing that it must take seriously the priority of the sacrament of baptism when it comes to being included in the most basic way among those who follow Christ. The lay clergy distinction has its importance, but it should not be understood as erasing the shared life of Christian discipleship in which we enter through our baptism. Now, Rick's uh, By What Authority was first published in 2003 and then revised and expanded in 2018. I started teaching ecclesiology in 1984. From early on, I had used Francis Sullivan's book, Magisterium, along with a few other books as a text. And what a great book! I learned so much from teaching. When Rick's Teaching with Authority came out in 1997, I switched over to that because I thought it was more directly accessible to the students. But then when he came out with By What Authority, I was overjoyed. It did cover a lot of the same material, but it was yet more accessible. And when Rick published the revised and expanded edition in 2018, I started using the book in the Introduction to Theology course that every master's student had to take. I did that because I judged it to be a book that every master's student should read, whether they would later, later take my ecclesiology course or not. By what authority is the book I was mainly thinking about in the opening of my lecture when I reflected on, on the one hand, the personalist nature of divine revelation, and on the other hand, the relational, collegial nature of the church. We're all called to be friends and colleagues. It is in this book that Rick further develops the material for which perhaps he is most known, the explanations and examples of levels of church teaching and the type of ascent each level calls for. To some extent, the book is a popularization of teaching with authority, but it goes much further in exploring the nature of power, the role of scripture and tradition, and the relationship of the sense of the faithful to the magisterium. Rick does not discuss theological method in a theoretical manner, but it is clear that he has thought long and hard about how to present his material systematically as one book length step-by-step argument. He begins by drawing upon the work of social sciences to explore the relationship between power and authority. He values how power within a community can be an empowering of others, but he also recognizes that there can be sometimes a need for authority to exercise power over others. After making many fine distinctions, he finally focuses on the need for authority to exude trustworthiness and accountability. In the classroom, my students have been able to share their own experiences, often in school or in social activities, or in the workplace, of authoritarian style regimes versus systems that are more free, supportive, transparent, and accountable. Now, after his first chapter in his book about authority, Rick spends the next four chapters drawing upon Vatican II and contemporary scholarship to address divine revelation, scripture, and tradition. In other words, what is there that requires authoritative guidance? What is the nature of revelation and how does scripture and tradition function as the primary embodiments of it? What do we mean when we say that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Why is formulated doctrine important, yet quite secondary to the community's experience of God through Christ and the Spirit? How do scripture and tradition reflect the mysterious collaboration of divine and human agency? Only after establishing this context does Rick begin to address the history of the magisterium how uh, the church in the early centuries gradually developed an episcopal structure in the office of the Pope, and how these structures have continued to develop over the time. Then he delivers the ecclesial vision of Vatican II, 
how the council overcame the overly papocentric teachings of Vatican I from 1870 by stressing the collegiality of bishops, the importance of the local churches, the role of the sense of the faithful. The church is a communion of baptized people who share a fundamental equality in spiritual dignity. What would it be like if everybody like, believed that in moments about the fundamental equality in spiritual dignity and make a difference? Rick explains the reasoning behind uh, why Pope Francis is reminding us that the church should be fundamentally synodal in character. A synodal church must be a listening church, whole and entire, and formed by a spirit of accompaniment, truly consulted, truly hearing the spirit, including the voices of the alienated of other Christians and of those of other religions. And so seven and twelve chapters have been devoted to setting the table. In the concluding five chapters, we've written that piece, the intricacies of various forms of magisterial authority, as well as various levels of teaching and types of ascent called forth. He offers this vision of a dialogical model of authority within a synodal church. Rick explores in depth the nature and proper role of the sense of the faithful. He talks about, quote, the Christian faith exhibited in its most basic form, not as academic theology or formal church doctrine, but as a faith sustained in a rich web of narratives, ritual devotions, artistic productions, exemplary moral witness, and daily human actions. He goes on to say, the lived faith must always have an existential priority in Christian life, since that lived faith is always richer and more compelling than its doctrinal articulation. None of this denies or diminishes the role of formal magisterial teaching authority. But throughout the church's history, formal doctrinal pronouncements have generally been issued in response to serious and enduring controversy regarding the substance of the Christian faith. It does not follow from the occasional need for such normative pronouncements, however, that doctrine represents the most profound expression of the faith. So take note here that Rick holds that it is not only formal doctrine, but also academic theology that needs to be subordinated to and in the service of the faith. A remarkable feature about what authority is the way that Rick ends each chapter in the section called Disputed Questions. He doesn't take a clear position on, on the controversial issues here, but rather presents them briefly and succinctly. These questions provide an opportunity for students to think hard and to express their opinions and feelings. Did patriarchal assumptions influence early church decisions? How can a tradition address new issues that emerge? Does synodality require that the voices of so-called lapsed Catholics be heard? How does one distinguish between broad cultural values and the voice of the Holy Spirit? What is the difference between public dissent and personal disagreement? Can either or even both be appropriate under certain conditions? What I am impressed with, after having taken a deep dive into Rick's works, is that he has not simply thought up pedagogically interesting questions, but even more so how each of the many questions that he raises reflects a wealth of academic research that he has published elsewhere. The feedback I have received from both undergrad and master students about it by what authority has been overwhelmingly positive. The great majority in favor of the book often mention that they are relieved to hear that it is possible to be a good Catholic and yet disagree with some church teachings. I am again and again surprised by the number of upper level religious studies majors and theology graduate students who say that they have never heard this point openly discussed before. Rick's also in favor of taking church teaching very, very seriously, too. Imagine what, what it would be like if everybody took what you have to see really, really seriously in the heart. Um, but, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, clarifying distinct levels of teaching and ascent in a way that affirms both the importance of belief and yet the possibility for responsible disagreement has been a major concern of Rick throughout his career, starting with his dissertation. It is something that is continually refined and tweaked. And by what authority you place a special emphasis on the duty of pastoral ministers to those who struggle with particular church teachings. 
Both my, my conservative and my progressive students are impressed with Rick's insistence that pastoral ministers present church teaching comprehensively and sympathetically while making explicit the binding character of the teaching involved and offering pastoral guidance that discourages disagreement that is quick, shallow, or selfishly motivated. I should mention that there are usually one or two students in any class who don't like the book by what authority. They will be among the few students who feel ambivalent about the whole course. In my graduate classes, they are usually the same ones who don't like Elizabeth Johnson's She Who Is. They're the students who organize the Eucharistic devotion. They're the students who would probably agree with a claim made on the website, Read My Professors. <laughs> Dr. Doyle is a very nice man, but can be quite liberal in his views of the church, and it makes some feel isolated. As much as he would like to think his theology is moderate left, it is left. <laughs> I have to agree with some of what that student wrote. I am indeed a very nice man. <laughs> but but, but, it, but it's, it's also true that I have throughout my career presented myself as a centrist while admitting that I lean slightly left. Yet it is also true that in our age of polarization, it is difficult, if not impossible, to identify a center. Where there used to be a center right and a center left, there is now a no man's land between the trenches. It is as if a great cultural tug of war has been going on, but then the rope snapped. Where the middle of the rope had been in is now a chasm that has opened up. It's like my student wrote. Those who used to be on the center left are now on the left, whether they want to be or not. In his lecture last night, as well as in some recently published writings, Rick addresses the problem of polarization. Even in the absence of a clearly defined center, Rick is someone who is striving for balance. And you know, Rick and myself, we, we are very open and concerned to, to the students, the conservative ones who maybe don't like the book and so on. Uh, not dismissive of those people at all. Um, but Rick's someone striving for a balance. I can say this lecture something similar to what I said about the disputed questions and by what authority. He was not just rattling off opinions. I hope that my lecture this morning uh, brings out, at least in some small way, how the lecture last night is grounded in a lifetime of deeply researched and carefully argued positions. So new, new directions in ecclesiology. I think that future Catholic ecclesiology needs to be yet more ecumenical. Uh, I was on an ecumenical dialogue between United Methodists and Roman Catholics with Rick some 20 years ago. One thing I and the entire group learned from Rick was to compare sacramental structures dynamically. In other words, rather than comparing practice of baptism, Eucharist, and ministry individually, it is better to examine the dynamics of baptism, Eucharist, and ministry considered as one complex process. The level of mutual recognition achieved concerning each other's practices was astounding. I asked Rick last night whether that was his original idea, whether he got that somewhere. He said he's pretty sure that that was his idea. <laughs> It's often said that the most important things that Catholics can do to further ecumenical progress is to strive to live out their faith more authentically. Rick's most significant ecumenical contribution is a relentless yet careful effort to reform structures in the Catholic Church. In a recent article, a masterpiece in theological studies, Rick applies a non-reductive sociological analysis to various aspects of church life and makes many concrete suggestions for changes in decision-making, the education of ministers, and liturgical rubrics. Ecclesial vitality is more important than structures, but the shape of structures impacts greatly the possibilities for living out ecclesial vitality. One might agree or disagree with some of Rick's specific recommendations, but I am struck by two things. One is how he balances his claims about the influential nature of organizational structures with attention to human intention, human freedom, and the activity of the Holy Spirit. The, the second thing I was very struck by is how deeply is his concern for the Catholic Church 
understood with ecumenical openness um, and, and how much that comes through. And, and he lives out what he called for last night. For all of his use of a hermeneutic of suspicion accompanied by a call for change, he manages to give priority to a hermeneutic of appreciation. If the Catholic Church could be compared to a hang glider that seems to be falling apart and heading for a crash landing, Rick is somebody who is hanging in there, try, trying to hold all the parts together, doing whatever he can to keep the church flying. I know there are many voices out there that say, I don't care if it crashes, or I hope it crashes, or it's already crashed. That is not what Rick Bellardi says. Last night he said a couple of times that he loves the Catholic tradition, and one time he said that he loves the Catholic Church. When he uses the word church, he includes everyone. You know, his most basic meaning of the word church refers to the people who belong to it. The future of ecclesiology must be both local and global. The majority of Catholics now live in the global south. Rick wrote a 2008 book, Ecclesiology for a Global Church, which is another book I've used in the classroom. He traveled widely to research this text and is full of many insights. He ends the work humbly, though, acknowledging the tenderness. Acknowledging the tenderness of the work, articulating well what I also see as a major task for the church today. He speaks of the challenge of building a bridge between two sides. On the one side, he says, there are the theological achievements of the theologians whose work led up to Vatican II the Council itself, and the results of many bilateral and multilateral ecumenical dialogues that have taken place since. I'm now going to start quoting. On the other side has been the new theological contributions of voices from the Global South, theologians, individual bishops, and regional episcopal conferences that are experiencing the global reality of the Church much more acutely than those of us who still live in the shadow of the Church's comfortable Eurocentrism. Also standing on that other shore have been new voices in the North who have experienced the multicultural character of dual belonging and life on the borders, including the work of Black, Latinx, feminist, Muharista, and womanist theologians. I believe that in many ways the gap between these two sides has grown or at least the enormity of the gap has become more recognizable to me. A great challenge facing both church and society today is the need to deal with our continuing Eurocentrism and whiteness. I cannot say that I completely grasp contemporary post-colonial and anti-racist perspectives, but I'm trying hard to listen. Some see in Vatican II a kind of catch-22. The church tried but was unable to truly overcome its deep Eurocentrism because of its deep Eurocentrism. I see a related phenomenon in, in the sense of frustration and sense of disappointment among some young Catholic theologians with the official leaders, structures, and policies of the Catholic Church. I've had the experience as a co-convener of the Ecclesiological Investigations Unit at AAR of hearing papers offered by young Catholic ecclesiologists that make no mention of Vatican II or of Pope Francis or of Catholic teaching whatsoever. These are papers in ecclesiology that do not cite Gallardi or many of the other distinguished ecclesiologists present here today. I have long been aware of theology in general that makes no mention of the church, but lately I have been encountering ecclesiology that is purely focused on narratives about local communities, concentrating on context, social location, justice, inclusion and identity. There are many reasons, many of them good ones, that underlie this phenomenon. I can understand why scholars focusing on marginalized or excluded people may at this time be bracketing out connections with the larger church, or only alluding to the larger church in negative sides. In several places, Vatican II documents express the universal humanism that can be read as undercutting is expressing concern for diverse peoples and cultures. At the time, the authors of the documents were trying to appeal to humanists, whether existentialists or Marxists, 
who accused the church of downplaying the importance of human fulfillment in this life. Gowdy and Spencer is trying to make the case that belief in the afterlife does not take away from the importance of life lived in this world. They were saying that Christians are humanists too. We can talk with each other. It's modern style emphasis on the universality of what it means to be human, however, is hard to detach from the concrete history of identifying that universal human as a white man. Is Vatican II and its continued implementation still relevant? Of course, I think it is. But I recognize this question as a present challenge when it comes to building upon the legacy of Rick Gillard. Vatican II has ever been at the center of Rick's work. He wrote in his editor's preface to the Cambridge Companion to Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council was the most significant event in the history of Catholicism since the Protestant Reformation. Still, Rick is very aware of the historical situation, situatedness of Vatican II and of its limitations. In Ecclesiology for a Global Church, he stated, Vatican II provided the Church with an opportunity positively to engage the forces of modernity at precisely the moment in which the cultural contours of our age were being, being redefined as postmodern, the pressing issues of our time do not yet all have clear and pervasive and persuasive solutions for the life of the church. Rick's work has been on the cutting edge of bringing the study of Vatican II into an engagement with issues of the postmodern world. Still, the challenges of bridging the gaps related to geography, ethnicity, race, gender, and social and economic status remain more daunting than ever. There is a growing awareness that progress in these matters cannot be achieved from one, only one side of the chasm. Perhaps as the synodal way develops, it can become more and more a path toward more radical inclusivity. To truly put forth the legacy of Rick the Lord, even with focusing on church authority, is more than I can do adequately in one lecture. Uh, I want to close with, with a passage from Rick's work that, among all the others, most left out of me. It's a passage that speaks to his personalism, to his focus on the texture of relationality and Christian spirituality. In one of Rick's early works, his 2002 book on marriage, A Daring Promise, he quotes a friend whom he calls Mary, who died of cancer in her early 30s. There are times, Rick, when I am embarrassed to admit how frequently my faith gives way in the face of death. I've had moments when I wasn't sure if I believed in Christ's divinity, or his real presence in the Eucharist, or even in the Trinity itself. But to all these times of doubt, there is one thing I've never questioned, and that is that the Paschal Mystery, the paradoxical logic that tells us that we find life only in dying, is the one indispensable key to unlocking the universe. In the midst of a thousand doubts, I have always clung to the witness of Jesus that there could be no rising without dying. And then Rick adds in his own words, Mary did not fear her approaching death, because she had embraced death, not as the final punctuation mark to her life story, but as a raw fact of her daily existence. I have affirmed the importance of life of communion to which we are all called, yet this life of communion can be fully realized, as Mary taught me, only when we are willing to enter into the paschal movement of dying and rising. So Mary taught Rick, Rick teaches us, and, and we should listen, and we should build on his legacy, because after all, he is the authority on authority in the Catholic Church. Thank you. Uh, Mary Hinsdale, colleague of Rick's, is going to hate what I'm going to say, uh, and is not is going to be surprised I'm the first person to say something. It's not a question. But Dennis, I think that your talk should be the introduction to that first volume of collected works of Rick Thank you.
in the Catholic Church, uh, but he, he does so uh, with uh, not only sociological awareness about uh, what power can do, what it should be, and, and what it often should be, but it is. Uh, uh, but I mean, he, he, he gives us this, this historical, historically grounded vision of, uh, of a church in which authority is a real thing. I mean, the, the bishops and popes have real authority and so on, but that, um, I mean, we're, we're, maybe it's a cliche, we're in a crisis situation and, and that uh, somehow something's got to move this lodge in. I mean, it seems to me like, like a synodality has the potential to be, to be what's going to do that. And, and so, uh, I thought it was interesting in the, uh, the Amazon Synod, uh, when this issue of uh, ordaining married men came up, and uh, I forget the exact number, maybe 64% uh, were in favor of it when, when they polled uh, the participants, and Pope Francis said, well, that's just not, not high enough at this time, but the implication is that when something if something uh, takes hold among the people deeply enough, that this really can help bring about change in a very legitimate way and, and in a way that we can pray that the Holy Spirit is maybe more actively involved than what we heard uh, Cardinal Ratzinger say last night about being involved in the selection of popes. <laughs> but, but, uh, I, I don't know if I, if I addressed enough your question. I have a question. Yes. Um, given that you started the talk with uh, the idea that revelation is a form of friendship with God, what do you see in your rereading of works for the role of friendship and authority? How do those two things coexist? That is also going to be talked about here this afternoon uh, by at least uh, three people. Uh, but th that's where I see, uh, you know, for Rick, just this, um, you know, authority has to be grounded in, in personal relationships. And authority is not just simply a formal thing. Uh, there are so many dimensions to, to authority. And uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, parents have authority. With, with their small children, but that, that really isn't what defines the relationship between children and parents. And, uh, that um, it, it's, this, it's, it's just this, this relational ground, and, and that, uh, you know, I had the experience this, this weekend. I, you know, the first time I came to Boston College so many years ago, I just found it like, like, such an intimidating place. When I come here now, it's like, I'm so welcome to that. And it's like, there's all this friendship going on here. I, maybe that's not a good answer. But... Uh, I believe Rick has a question. Yeah, Sorry. I was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I spent much of this morning thinking, is there sort of um, rules for this in terms of what I do? Uh, I just want to add to that. Um, Catholic Theological Society of America for at least six, eight years, has been offering to underwrite dioceses that will have lunches with bishops and theologians uh, when they read a common text. And the idea is simply to develop kind of relationships of trust where bishops are over in the, you know, the chancery, some of the theologians over here, but they're actually not doing public work but just doing the common work of Christians reading our tradition together. And um, we have a lot of CTSA presidents here, but in my experience, we get about three requests a year, and that's about it. And every year we offer to underwrite this, we'll buy the books, we'll help pay for dinners, we just want to encourage bishops and theologians to get over distrust and to read texts together and talk to one another. And it seems to me that question of friendship and authority is somehow connected to that idea. How do you build trust in relationships unless there's this broader kind of baseline of respect for one another? 
And we're just as a church not very ideally suited to encourage that kind of thing. And when the offers are made, I don't think people know what to do with it. Uh, we just don't have a lot of experience. So, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, I want to I want to piggyback on with something that strikes me one is the foibles of this microphone. It it seems like the outstanding fact, one of the outstanding sociological facts of the last half century of theology is really the rise of the lay theologian. And I started my career in a seminary. Rick started his career in a seminary. In fact, by a weird accident of fate, we were both in the same seminary, and I had his office. Um, we, when you're in a seminary, it kind of drives home to you, first of all, the sort of bifurcation between the theology that's being done in seminaries and taught, and the theology that's being done and taught in universities. But the second thing that it kind of drives home, at least to me, is we're in a church that has basically trinitine structures. Uh, and those structures ensure certain kinds of relationships between a bishop and his clergy, and so on and so forth. And so as long as you're in the situation where the theology is being done by clergy and religious, you have all kinds of opportunities for both juridical and personal relationships. To, to be formed. We've had this tremendous shift to lay theology, lay the, theology being done by lay persons, which I think is tremendously enriching for theology. But institutionally, the church is sort of, with the, my, my experience, my sense, this is much as my sense, let me leave it at that size, is it's sort of been greeted as kind of a, like a kind of an odd aberration that will sort itself out once we have more priests. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of creativity, like the initiative that you describe, I think is a great creative initiative. There hasn't been a lot of institutional creativity to like figure out what we're going, how we're going to establish some kind of relational structures creatively for that, that really will meet this new situation and, and appreciate it as like the permanent shift that in fact I think it is, right? So we're just living on the scheme of Tridentine structures and not really properly imagining the moment that we're in. Also, uh, for future respondents, I think the issue is that people were covering the Bluetooth receiver with their hands, so just grasp it by the top. Thanks. Um, I'm Rob Broderick. I'm one of Rick's uh, former students. Um, I think we, you, I really, Dennis, I appreciate a lot of your reading today of Rick's um, collective work, and I think we've put a hint on a number of his contributions. Of course, one of which that we've talked at great length about is a growing divide right, between um, left and right. We put those names on it, and leaving a sort of no man's land in between, as you said, and really put a value on uh, his work as an incrementalist and as saying that there's, there's space in between. I think there's a couple other things that came to mind that I'd like to acknowledge and, and hear your reflections on. I think there's a growing body in the church, not only on the left and the right, but in a group I've started calling uh, the, the wounded wanderers, right? The, the folks that have been left um, if this is a battleground who have just been left hurt and on either side and are just don't know where to be. And I think a lot of Rick's work speaks to that, that group. I think there's a couple other aspects of his work that I've really grown to appreciate you um, acknowledge. One of which, um, not only does he hold that particular space for us, um, but is an excellent communicator. As we were a witness to last night, not only is there excellent content in what he has to say, but he has encouraged his students and his colleagues to present themselves well, not just to read an academic paper that no one can understand, but to present that that everyone else can understand. And I know personally um, that I have had everything from the carrot to the stick 
um, from him in teaching me that hard lesson that says you have to be intelligible to real people. And I appreciate that contribution, and I think that that's one of his um, real contributions to the, to the field. I'd like to draw then one more element out of what you said and ask you to respond to, to this particular part. I was struck when you were talking back at, um, you're talking about your past experience with some of your ecumenical work, right? And how it's really encouraging a point of view that says, let's not line up baptism to baptism, Eucharist to Eucharist, but really approach things in a more holistic sense of the way that I would think about it. I think that's another thing that, um, I've learned to acknowledge in, in Rick's work. I think he's a very holistic thinker. So you mentioned this also in the context of talking about the ordinary magisterium of the church, right? That's a really holistic concept. He really opens that. There's a lot in there that I think, as you're saying, a lot of your students are surprised to find. I'd like your opinions on that. Is that reading? Would you agree? You know about Rick being a holistic. Or I, I think he really is. But what the contribution of that in today's world, again, where we have polarizing opinions, are those closing the facets off? Is there something about that holistic approach that's really beneficial to the church entering the third millennium? So, Rob, is there anybody else in this room of whom you're a former student? Oh, <laughs> I'm also a former student of Dennis Doyle. He was my <laughs> master's thesis advisor, so I should have mentioned that as well. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, more carrot than stick uh, from, from Dennis, because he's a very nice guy. <laughs> Sometimes when you mention the kind of theology that never mentions 
you know, the, I'm wondering aspect is sometimes missing, and I think we can. Uh, but anyway, I think I think that is a great gift to us from Rick, and uh, I would hope that we can find a way to do that so that there's a connection between you know what the tradition called paideia, which is formation, and Wissenschaft, which is knowledge, and that one does not have to negate the other. Yeah, yeah, I really agree with that. I mean, I think. Part of the history of, of academic theology in the last 50 or 60 years has been trying to distinguish theology from evangelization and catechesis, make sure that you know we're not doing that stuff, we're doing you know solid academic stuff. But to be able to see the connections between those things, and those students who I mentioned, maybe the ones who don't like she who is or by what authority, there's somehow they're not being fed by those books, and maybe there are things that they, they need to be fed by. And we have to do a better job of, of what, what Rob called being holistic. You know, I mean, I mean if, if you're going to be a theologian, you do have to learn, you know, in a certain sense, to think analytically, to think, uh, you know, to, to make really strong distinctions. But but in the end, I, those connections have to be somehow at least present in the background and be present in the life of the community. Um, and actually reflecting on myself, 
you know, even thinking back to your own sense of of, of mourning, you know, that you, you all get the tears and pathos for a certain lack of reverence of that and who was on that for, for you and me and then you like Rick kind of defines it, you know, is that um, it's really hard to let a certain form of church die. And if I see that in myself perhaps and maybe it's just for me, you know, when I look at the other side of the divide, I see that over there too. And so again, this is a very personal reflection, but it just struck me that you know when we came to it and we did the talk is and I wonder, you know, your thoughts on it. Is, is that a theological rubric? I mean, I'm not an ecclesiologist, so I don't know if you're not. I'm grateful for those of you who are and help me know the whole section. But, but, you know, that, that, that ability or willingness to let go and let a certain form of church die in a way that we can't control, um, but with hope, too. I don't understand. That may be. Anyway, it's just a personal question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man. I, uh, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think about that. And, um, and just, just as I, I think that so many of the changes that we experience, uh, even though we might be uh, inclined to find who to blame and what to blame, but so many of these changes I think are related to large scale cultural and social changes that are beyond. Uh, any of our control, and um, but I, I think that I mean th there are certain things uh, like I mean I don't think we're going to let the Bible go or let, let the Eucharist go or uh, you know probably Catholics we're not we're not going to let the office of the bishop go and and, and but the, 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 they would change so radically uh, and then we have to be. Will, willing to let go of things. Uh, I, I think so much in, in the history of, of Catholic theology has to do with uh, the phenomenon of sacral legitimation. You know, the, 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 um, trying to prove, you know, what what's sacred, and a lot of that has to do with defending certain people in power and authority. You know, which church is the one true church? Which which one has alone and four marks? And uh, different answers to that coming from different traditions and so on. And um, I mean, I think sacral legitimation is not, is not a bad thing. Uh, I think, it, you know, it, it can be, like anything else, it can be used in a bad way. But yeah, we, we, um, we, we do have to be um, self-reflective about those tendencies to hang on to the things that, that are dear to us. And, um, but, you know, if, if some people now are not so interested in Vatican II, I, I do think Vatican II, uh, I'm not going to say it's scripture, I'm not going to say it's the Eucharist, but I think it's maybe like, uh, it's the Catholic Church with the, with the French Revolution, it's the world history. That the French Revolution may be part of European history, it's also part of the history of the whole world. And we should all know about the French Revolution and its continuing presence and impact today. And I, I think there's something about Vatican II uh, that it really is like that in, in Catholic tradition. And maybe it will become, say, relatively less important. And maybe there are even reasons why to let it slip out of focus for a while. But, 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 but I, I, think, I think it'll come back and, and, and so on. But yeah, I, I mean, I think you raise a, a profound uh, question. And, and, and that relates the theological to, to the spiritual. And, and it is the, and the whole question of dying and rising. And, being able to let go and, and so on. And, um, you know, I thank you for raising it.
this is why the mix work and the companion, especially because there has to be a new bridge that is built, that has to be built, not just between the church and the world, but within, within the church itself, with different components that we took for granted that they heard the language from the pastors, that has not happened. So I believe that there are some things all I can do that are dead already, that are gone. But there is uh, much work and we uh, could be very generous at uh, different levels uh, in scholarship in CPSA. This should be a model of the leader engagement and of commitment because I think that in fact we cannot disconnect the faith of Adiantu from the, the faith of Catholicism in a way that is unrecognizable to itself. And so I admire both what you said yesterday and what Chris said when they talk about that many times. You look at that and, and I do believe there is a, so there's a plan in what Chris said last night. And, and it's a matter of, of courage and vision here. Yes. Thank you, Nathan. Um, <clears throat> so, so many of the questions I think have 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 said everything that <laughs> needed to be said and and so I don't necessarily have a, an immediate response uh, other than to say thank you.